This is going to be a long video talking about a lot of things, mostly things related to being an animator and finding one's path as an artist. I was interviewed by Josh, who's an animation student, and he asked me some really thought-provoking questions. I'll link his Instagram in the description. I had to use the internal mic from my laptop, so unfortunately my audio isn't super duper good, but the questions he asked got us talking about a lot of things that will be helpful to other animators and digital artists. In this video, I break down exactly how, why, and when I got into animation. I want everyone to know there are, are multiple paths that one can follow. You can go to art school, which is a legitimate path, and I'm not knocking it, but you don't necessarily have to go the traditional route. Anyway, my neurotransmitters are depleting, so I'm going to get back to drawing. And maybe I'll make more long videos like this where I attempt to say words for an extended period of time. So how's it been? Well, I mean, since I saw you, I mean, it's been a whole new world, but... <laughs> yeah, it's like pretty out, crazy. out there is just whole, very different, you know? Yeah. Not, not as social, which some people say that's a good thing. So that's uh, that's kind of funny. Yeah. I mean, I've always been fairly introverted, so my lifestyle hasn't changed that much. A lot of the work that I was doing, like live festivals and tour visuals for concerts, it all shut down. Huh. So I had to kind of reconfigure my workflow, figure out some new ways to monetize it. Yeah, I heard a lot of people who are like independent contractors and freelancers, a lot of their, um, a lot of their jobs just, you know, they got cut off uh, from the, like beneath them because no one's going out to like concerts anymore because, you know, social guidelines. And so I know a lot of people understand that type of issue. So. Yeah, yeah, it's had a snowball effect because like a bar that would have bands play that affects the bands and it also affects people who would be running the lights and then that affects people who are at home making content for the lights and for the projectors, which is what I was doing. So even though I wasn't like needing to be physically at places, mm -hmm. the type of work that I was doing needed to be there. <laughs> yeah. Like the levels of the pipeline just like affects everyone. Right. Like the people, the, the ta not even just the talent themselves, it's the, the support structure around it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, a lot of changes that have happened, like in response to it, has been doing more things just online, like on the internet, streaming, uh, doing live streams. A lot of concerts, like Glastonbury, was streamed, and you had to pay to subscribe and watch it. Mm -hmm. It's like not the same experience as actually being there, but it's something. Yeah, finding ways to adapt to it. Oh, I like your uh, background, by the way. That uh, Kira poster. Yeah, I've been looking for like, I, I love movie posters, like really nice, iconic movie posters. And I, I saw that and I had to get it. I just Dude, had to. Every artist has sort of a different logic to what they're doing. Like even though there's like standards and workflows and techniques that everyone shares, like everyone's mind is still unique to them. Mm -hmm. You know, like you have your own unique voice. So when I see something someone else does, like even though from a technical level, they can kind of understand what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. There's still things that I'll see and I, I'm just like, like I, I understand it, but I also had no idea how they did it, if that makes sense. I, I completely understand that because like you could be like standing shoulder to shoulder with someone and they'll be doing this crazy things like, wait, but how are you doing that? It's like these certain skills. It's like how do you get your fingers? How do you get the like the the color that way? Yeah. Just you could have the same type of material, just different outcomes. Totally. Yeah. In my studio work with all my other classmates, I'm seeing what they're doing. It's like, how they do? How are they doing that? And then I'm looking at my stuff. It's like, okay, they have the same stuff. I should be able. But like that's like. It's like FOMO. It's like fear of missing out. It's like I, I shouldn't focus on like what they can do. Actually, I can appreciate it, but like I don't have to like focus on that. Yeah. yeah. No, totally. We all we're all running our own race. Yeah. If you're on a track and you're trying to get to the finish line, if you look too much at the person next to you, you trip up, mm -hmm. fall over. You just gotta focus on your own yeah. goals. Because. But yeah, it's a, definitely yeah. you're not alone in that. Like that's yeah. a super relatable 
problem. Yeah. Like scaling up, like, you know, everyone, you, you walk you online and you see everyone that's online, like, especially like, uh, let's say I look at your work, right? I see all these finished projects and then say like, you have a little bit of a name drop saying, oh, I have my stuff on Adult Swim. And it's like, you look at it, it's like, how can I get there? It's like, yeah. just keep working. It's fine. It's, you'll yeah, get yeah. there. It's yeah. It's just how it is. And then you don't have to focus, like, just do you, it's, uh, self-work, so. Totally. Yeah. So, so, uh, so is this, like, you're going to ask me questions? I have, like, a couple, like, broad questions. And then, honestly, it's more like a conversation base. Uh, that's it. I just want to get an idea of, like, your um, your experience in the industry and how did you get into like animation? Yeah, and yeah. What do you like about it and all that? Okay, so. cool. So, uh, do you want to start recording? Yeah. Uh, actually, I already started. So, like, oh, the, nice, the, nice. Hopefully, so, I didn't say anything too. Uh, really. that's whatever. I I I could uh, what is it called? Uh, in post, I'll cut so whatever. So. That's, okay. Cool. Yeah, we'll we'll get into that. Whatever. All right. Uh, so um. Uh, I guess start from the, from the beginning. It's like your history. I, I read up on your uh, your website of like how you went to uh, like, you know uh, your private school and how you got into animation, doing your flip books. So, like I want to hear from you. How did you get it? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, like most artists, the story normally starts with you were drawing since you were a kid. Mm -hmm. You know, like always had a passion or interest in visuals and cartoons. Uh, but in terms of like animation, I didn't start until I was 19 and it, I was really inspired by this animator musician, Chad Van Galen. Chad Van Galen? Yeah. He, what he does is he's like totally a self, like everything he does is an independent studio from his music to his animation, to his album covers. So he plays all the instruments, sings all the songs, and then he animates by hand all his music videos. So like everything that you see that has his name on it came from his mind. And so that really inspired me because like watching shows on TV or seeing a Pixar movie, you look at the credits and there's hundreds and hundreds of team members. So it's kind of daunting. Like, well, if I get into animation, I'm going to like, I have to be on this huge team, another like cog in the machine or whatever. But I realized, okay, there's, people on the internet who are just one person that are making cartoons and publishing them. So that really inspired me as seeing that as another path. Like you don't have to, everyone doesn't have to follow the exact same path. So that really inspired me. And that's when I started uh, just like drawing flip books and not knowing at all what I was doing. Like I didn't know any principles of animation. I didn't even have a light box. So I was just like drawing random things straight ahead, one frame after another with absolutely no storyboard or no character designs, just like a stream of consciousness. And needless to say, the my first animations had like no story or like, <laughs> like reason to them. They were just random movement and strange stuff. But just seeing these still frames after you scan them in to the computer and then watching them move, it was like, like all that hard work, months of just obsessing over these individual movements. When you finally see them move, it just becomes worth it because you get to see this breathing, living thing. And it almost moves in ways that surprises you, especially if you were like me where you didn't have a light box or you weren't like really able to see how the animation was gonna look. So that was like the catalyst of becoming obsessed with animation. And so then like I just on my Christmas list, I put down books like The Illusion of Life by uh, Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson. And uh, Illusion of Life. I swear I have that book, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Probably do. Probably. Animator Survivor Kid, mm -hmm. Richard Williams, just a whole bunch of them. And uh, I, I didn't go to college, but I because I've always just felt more comfortable just learning on my own. I don't really like being in a classroom and just all the distractions of people and like the whole social aspect of it is very distracting to me. So just for me personally, I do a lot better if I'm able to carve my own routine and 
just focus deeply on the task at hand. So like those books pretty much are my education, like my college education and also YouTube tutorials. And then, um, so I spent like three years just making music videos for myself, made zero money off it, just, you know, hanging out in my parents' basement. Luckily, I support a family, supporting my interest in trying to develop these skills. Um, and then like for like money jobs, I just did odd job stuff, like uh, building fitness equipment with my best friend's dad, just helping his small company. And then I was did uh, some truck loading for a few months uh, out of a warehouse and like would just work on animation when I got home. But uh, yeah, so like the first four short films I made were just music videos for my own songs. And then I was like, well, I don't really, like I need to kind of figure out how to monetize this thing. Like it's a lot of hard work to like get zero money out of it. So it was really just doing it purely for passion. And I think in a way that there's a benefit to that where if you spend like five years just like more focused on just learning and developing your craft, then once you get to points where you're ready to start getting work and jobs, you have that that fuel there that um, like you've put the miles in to be ready to like really, you know, start doing things, like start monetizing it. So but I still just had no idea how to even do that because I didn't really want to work in a studio. I still wanted to be independent. So just like browsing the internet, you know, just keeping my eyes glued to Google for animation opportunities. And I just started typing in animation contests, music video contests, just something to get some publicity. And I came across this uh, Flaming Lips contest on this website called Genero which uh, the band just like put out a call for people to make a music video for their song. It didn't have to be animated. It could be anything, any material. We're doing like either live action or like if they did animation, it was normally CGI. So there was definitely a lack of 2D animation. And this band, Flaming Lips, tend to like super psychedelic stuff, which is kind of a fit to what I was into at the time. So I just made a really psychedelic music video on paper. Um, like, like I don't know how many frames. It was definitely around like 1,000 to 2,000 drawings, and there were different layers. It's been like three months on it, working like 15 hours a day, every single day. Some days I worked like 20 to 30 hours straight. Super unhealthy, don't recommend it. Oh, um, I, I understand that. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> Yeah, I think most most animators have definitely like had that crunch time. Yeah, um, but it's a good metaphor. I like to use like animators are masochists. Like we do it for the fun of it, even though it's very tedious. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta like that's when I later I started focusing more on just time management and like learning how to pace myself healthily because like it's just not sustainable in the long term. But uh. Contest tight deadline had to get it done, so I got it done literally hours before the timer went out, and uh, yeah. So then they picked it, so it actually won, and uh, it was like there was prize money. So it was the first project where I learned okay, there's a way to make money off of making really weird, nonsensical animations. Like there's an audience that are into. Like there's a niche for every single different type of animated thing. It's not all just kids stuff. Like every age group, every type of interest, there's so many markets to fill. It's just a matter of how do you find them? That's often the hardest part is just the awareness aspect. So then like I did a few more contests and like it was hit or miss and I realized, okay, doing contests isn't actually sustainable either because it's a coin flip you could spend all this time months working on something then they don't pick it and that's three months down the drain with absolutely like no financial gain like there's an artistic gain you can add it to your showreel you can use it to try to get more work but not sustainable so then uh I'm trying to think here there's like 
I was like when I was 23 into like 26, just kind of like still just trying to figure out how to, how do you make a living as an artist independently? And eventually um, I just started reaching out to different bands. Instead of trying to win contests, I started directly reaching out to them, asking them, are you interested in a music video? Just a short email, nothing too long. Just like get the conversation rolling and started getting some responses back. Then I started getting some gigs that way where, okay, so I actually have someone who's willing to pay me. And a uh, tip of advice for freelancing is like have a contract and also ask for 50% of the budget up front because the worst thing in the world is to start working on something and two months later they pull the plug and you're out. Like, And there's nothing you can do about it. But if people put in some of their own money, they have skin in the game. So, you know, if they pull out, then at least you have 50% of the budget that was agreed upon up front. So definitely do that because I've made that mistake and it sucks. <laughs> so then, um, yeah, so I started doing some music videos with one band, Moon Duo. They do like psychedelic music, of course. So having the flaming lips as something to show them like, okay, here's a completed co concept. Here's proof that a music video can be done. It really helps to have some kind of completed project, whether it be your, your thesis for school, just something that shows that you can finish something from start to finish and you have a completed product and you can say, here's actual results that you can point to to give them an idea of what they can expect. So I did a music video for them and Someone in their pipeline, their marketing team, uh, got it on Adult Swim, which was like, I had nothing to do with that. Like, so I didn't try to reach out to them or anything. It's just like someone else. So it was this cascading effect of you reach out to one person and then they could be connected to someone who's connected to a network. So it's like this domino effect of you just got to find the smallest domino that you can knock over that's relevant. And then I'll have this snowball effect and who knows what can happen out of it it's a random world but you have to set yourself up for those random opportunities that could lead to something more and so then uh someone this lighting designer for the red hot chili peppers saw the adult swim thing and then he got in contact with me so then it was like this whole like all of a sudden i couldn't find work and then all of a sudden people are reaching out to me from this like random Facebook message to a, one of the members of Moon Duo asking, hey, do you want a music video? But like, if I never made that message, cause I'm pretty, like I said, I'm introverted, fairly shy, prefer to keep to myself. But uh, luckily the internet is like a really good thing for introverts because you don't have to call people. In fact, most people don't want you to call them. Like most people would rather just get a quick email where it doesn't take up as much of their time. So it can really work out if you play to your strengths and uh, you don't necessarily have to change yourself to try to fit into some machine. You can create your own machine that's more catered towards your strengths and your personality. So then uh, I started working for the lighting designer and that introduced me to the concept of animation loops well, I mean, of course, you know, like walk cycles. Yeah, of course, walk like, cycles. Yeah, yeah. And then things like uh, just revolve, go again, come out of nowhere. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So, like, I knew about, like, yeah, like how to animate a walk cycle, but I didn't understand, like, there is a whole market of animated loops that people use for concerts mm -hmm. where it'll just be some normally abstract, sometimes figurative, but it's normally abstract, goopy, psychedelic just things that you can't really explain with words, but are like cool visuals. Yeah, this is the special effects, like say uh, on Dead Mouse, like he has those like lighting things on his like big LCD screens. Those stuff will loop back, will activate exactly. to it's like, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And so that's like a whole other market for animators. And, uh, you know, typically is like more 3D CGI stuff. So again, it's like, there's a market that fell for 2D animators where a lot of people prefer the hand-drawn look you know it's like a timeless quality to it there's a finish to it that's just different it's like 
the type of animations of uh, like stop motion versus you know like a 90s uh, anime and then like like uh, modern cartoons there's just a certain look to it that you like yeah totally and like i think part of it might also be that hand-drawn things even if it's drawn digitally people can relate to it more because everyone has experience with crayons like as a child drawing things so there's this tactile experience to it that people can immediately relate to and understand whereas something that's cgi not to detract from 3d art in any way whatsoever but sometimes it's harder for people to necessarily relate to it where it can feel a little bit colder whereas the hand-drawn things often there's a warmth to it that uh like everyone can kind of connect to yeah, those strokes are familiar. It's like you could have done it. It's like it's, yeah. it's pleasing to your mind in a way. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So like, yeah, that doing the chili pepper stuff. Well, actually, it was for Incubus, but um, the the lighting design. His main thing is red hot chili peppers. But my first gig with him was doing visuals for the Incubus tour, 2017, and and then um, yeah. So I went down to Florida and was like animating on a table, just like around people, which I was never used to. And I was in a dressing room and there was like band members coming in and out behind me, looking over my shoulder. It's like trying to focus, but also trying to, you know, socialize at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's like a very mind expanding experience. Uh, but then after that, I realized, okay, there's like a ton of bands that want these loops. So how can I kind of repurpose animation cycles and things that I've already made, these creatures, how can I put them into digital packs that people can buy? So then I started researching how to start an online store. I use Shopify, but it doesn't really matter. Like anything that has a payment processor. And uh, that became like the next major focus was generating passive income instead of like having to spend so many hours every week just constantly pushing the pedal to the metal, trying to get things done by deadlines. How can I mitigate some of that and make it to where I don't need to do that all the time? And the answer was coming up with digital products because digital products, you don't have to ship them. You don't have to create them physically. There's no overhead. And if someone doesn't buy it, you don't lose, like you don't have like a million t-shirts in your closet they have to sell that are just wasting away in boxes. Yeah. The digital product, it's like people buy it they get it. You just sometimes have to answer an email here and there. Advice for animators would be figuring out ways to like repurpose these assets that you've already built. Like if you make Photoshop pictures and you've developed your own brushes, you could make packs of brushes and sell them on Gumroad and like post on Instagram. Here's a picture I made with this brush pack. Oh, and by the way, if you want it, you can get this brush pack on Gumroad. Yeah, advertise yourself. So, why not? Yeah. It's your place. Exactly. Yeah. I think it's like those animations, like I see like those animations on Twitch streams, like on the little side bits, like someone subscribe, those little animations, that works too. Well, it's the yeah. same same idea, just, you know, different packaging. Totally. Yeah. The opportunities are pretty much endless. It's just like what you can do with animation evolves with technology and what people are using it for. <laughs> but there's always something because like we're such visual creatures we like to see things moving around that makes so much sense it's like instead of having to um like just do project by project just create create and then post it and if someone wants it they'll have it type of thing yeah, yeah. it's not not something that will just automatically replace mm -hmm. my work I, i've been doing the the digital products since 2017 so four years and it's like i'm about it's like 50% of my income right now is just a Patreon subscription service for digital animation packs and then just my online shop, mm -hmm. um, which is like 50%. So I still have to, you know, get out there. And it's normally it's just safer to have a mix of things anyways. Like if you put all your eggs in one basket and then that basket breaks, like all your eggs fall out and, you know, you're not in a very good place. Plus like websites are always changing. Like if you just totally rely on, on YouTube and then all of a sudden, like they, you, your channel gets demonetized, for instance, well, you're in a really bad place. If you were just relying on AdSense money, 
which is why I like it. That's why so many YouTubers, they do sponsorships and sell their own merch and all that, just kind of spread it out. Like increasing your revenue streams, like what you said, you know, creating your merch and everything, going to like a like live streaming, your own videos online, uh, the, the brushes themselves, all those little small products, they add up, they count. Right? Yeah, totally. And when yeah. one fails, you know, you make sure you are sure that there's other ones to supplement. Yeah, you have to experiment. But there's like a, a phase where there's an experimental phase where you just have to put out a lot of things and not give up because a lot of people give up before they hit that point where they actually will start seeing the results. So it's a little bit of a gamble, but um, once you find something that works, double down on whatever is working. And then the things that are just draining you and taking away from your time are just like not worth it, not what you're passionate about. It might be ease off those a little bit. That makes, that makes, that makes total sense. Like I, I see a lot of your works are like, uh, like animated loops and towards like music videos. Like have you ever thought about doing like, uh, like narrative work? like? onto like stories and yeah. like and like that i definitely want to do more stuff like that I've done a little bit like a few of the music videos have the more recent music videos have a little bit of a story yeah like a little fishes by the linen clay pool delirium you see that one it's like a dystopian story these little worm people getting eaten by fishes <laughs> uh and there's like a brain that controls the world, but they're, it's all just based off their lyrics, which tell like a very sort of Dr. Seuss type surreal story. Mm. But I would like to do more stuff that's, yeah, more narrative, like even with dialogue and a more coherent story that makes sense. But uh, this past year, I changed a little bit. I did some like commercials, um, some work with another animator working on his pilot and um just like experimenting with different things that are still animation but a little bit out of my comfort zone like more bigger teams and whatnot mm -hmm. but it's it's good to like not get too comfortable with any one thing like sometimes you do gotta push yourself and get out there a little bit you gotta polish your your metal like grind it out a little sometimes you need to keep yourself sharp yeah yeah, yeah. makes sense um my next question is like um I'd like things like animations like yours which i think kind of fit have you seen like um the midnight gospel oh yeah yeah i, I looked at his work and he's like wait i know like someone's art <laughs> and that's what made me go look for like your like your card um, oh, cool. <laughs> it's like, it's during the time, uh, like right after we met, like I was having like a, like a moving, like scare. And so I was about to be moving. So I packed all my stuff up. And so I just went around looking for like your, your work. And uh, where is it? I'm glad you found it. I'm glad I gave it to you. I always feel like such a buffoon giving out a business card, but the fact that you were talking about animation to the store clerk, yeah. like looking for books, I felt like oh, I just got to talk yeah. to this guy. Nice. I still have it. It's <laughs> awesome. I saw that. It's like, that's so iconic. Dude, thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. You're welcome. It's like, it works. And I guess like I've been seeing, uh, what is it? Uh, like in the past, I've seen like you know, the Japanese, like they give out like, their cards to like individuals just to introduce themselves. Right, and then I recently uh, rewatched what is it, um, American Psycho, I think. Hmm. And so the, the, the card scene is like, oh, <laughs> it's like that's yeah. a thing as well. Yeah. So I, I think it's very iconic. So there was a meme of uh, that scene, but they're all handing out their like Pokemon. Cards. Oh yeah. <laughs> so it was like the rarest card. Yeah. The guy pops out with uh, the Charizard. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Speaking of that, like I was so happy. Um, they had a. Um, a reprint of that Charizard, right? And I don't play Pokemon, like the training card game, but I I, I, got, I pulled it. So I was like really happy because no one had it at the like, early 2000s when I was. So it was very funny. Man. So I, I, I can emphasize, it's like, oh, that's an awesome freaking card. 
Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have any of your original cards? Uh, I was a, I was a Yu-Gi-Oh guy, and ah. so like I, I knew a Pokemon. I never knew how to play it. But they were cool. I played the games, but like eh, I was never really like the guy picking up cards like that. Right. right. Well, I, I was I was, but like not recently. So. Yeah, there's, I wish I held on to mine because they're like going for so much on eBay right now. Yeah, I, I felt I like sold, <laughs> I sold all mine to this on a garage sale to this one dude who was with his mom. He had like a super long ponytail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it just sticks out in my memory, but he's probably like making bank now with all my originals. It's uh, it's it's such a weird thing. Somehow nostalgia comes back, and yeah. I. I feel like when it comes back, like, you know, art as well, like, uh, your loops, like, and how, like, uh, like Pokemon cards, like, even just little small bits and pieces, they're kind of, like, the same. They just kind of get printed out in a way, and then people consume it. And, you know, humans attribute value to that. So I was thinking, it's like, oh. I was wondering, it's like, have you tried, I know it's a really bad thing right now, but, like, you making your loops into, like, NFTs? So I know not a ton about that world. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm kind of just like wait and see. Um, I know there's like very enthusiastic camps on either side of the whole argument. Yeah. So I just feel like I would be stepping into like like a a fire <laughs> like with my audience because because like a lot of artists are like super super against it because mm -hmm. it has very you know harmful effects on the environment mm -hmm. but then like other artists are very for it because it gives anyone the opportunity to bypass the, the gatekeepers of the fine art world and you know like monetize your art in a whole new way and it gives people a new a new chance so there's i think there's valid arguments on both sides of the equation but it's also like the whole nft world is something that i just don't really have the mental energy to focus on because i just want to work on things that i understand a little better but at the same time it's like you know miss is it possible that i'm missing out on some opportunity so yeah yeah i, don't know. I i'm in the same boat like i'm in speculation because like, i want to be like you know environmentally friendly because i i've researched like could i is this an avenue i should go into but like it, it feel like you know kind of like making the deal with the devil type of thing it's like ah i probably shouldn't so yeah it is that but, type of like weighing the odds yeah it's really speculative and like such a volatile thing like the whole crypto world mm -hmm. i'd rather just focus on the things that i totally know are working and like that's just my philosophy personally but yeah who knows i i i'm not in the stage yet to like be able to think like can i like sell my artwork that way like i'm not that level yet i i can't speculate myself like that yeah and the type of stuff that sells it's like you can have a really like real made piece of art mm -hmm. but then like it's like a meme of some internet joke that sells for two million dollars so it's not so much about the art it's more about who is publishing it and what's the story behind it yeah. like how outrageous or absurd is this nft the yeah. types of things people are turning into i guess my next question uh what do you think of like uh like other musicians and artists that are kind of in the same avenue like you like a uh, like making music and adapting uh into like animations like uh like porter robinson like and like uh, i think uh like imagine dragons they have their music they bring it over to like, you know, animators and they create stuff together. What do you think of things like that? Well, I think it's great. I, I'm not too familiar with their work, but like the whole concept of it. Yeah. It's like more merging of music and animation is always a good thing because the two are so similar. Cause like with animation, you have so much control over the timing more than you would have on live action where you can individually manipulate each frame sync it up to the soundtrack have things happen on different accents and different beats and also like i don't know if, if you experience this but like when you listen to music or when i listen to music i see colors like i see not not even colors but like morphing like i can't even explain it it's like not even shapes either it's like textures that are alive i don't even know how to explain it but like certain songs 
like the different tones have different like movie moving shapes and colors but they're hard to they're really ambiguous like hard to describe with words so i feel like like music can inspire visuals and vice versa visuals can inspire music so they're really like a yin and yang type interaction they're made for each other visual and audio just that's it those two words together it's like it makes perfect sense like mm -hmm. for any of the the senses of your body that to like you can manipulate and affect I think that's a great thing it's like if animators are able to like affect their the taste the smell then it would have been crazy like you know like uh like 4d movies with the uh smoke and the wind at mm -hmm. the same time it that would be like amazing i guess right I guess yeah. I guess Disney World does that. If you watch a movie like and you turn the sound off, like a scary movie, it's so much less scary because you don't have those audio cues that are subconsciously telling you to be tense. And if you just watch it on mute, it almost looks like ridiculous, like funny. It doesn't like it's just like these long, like panning shot or a zoom in of like a door, and then it like opens and it's just like a ridiculous looking monster that comes out. But there's no like you don't hear that jump scare like you see it but you don't feel the impact because the audio is not there like some things the uh the whirling of the violin right before they open the door you don't have that suspense you just have like what's there open mm -hmm. just the lack of that audio just yeah so like yeah like with animation like the audio is so important even just youtube videos if you watch a YouTube video of someone talking or a vlog or something, there's like a ton of noise in the background, but the camera is 4K. The noise has way offsets, whatever, however good the visuals are. But like you can have a, a video that's just shot on someone's phone, but like if there's no, you know, constant trains running by or loud people talking in the background, you can actually hear it better. You're more likely to actually watch it. And there's all this data that shows it with on YouTube's uh, analytics, like the watch time of different videos that show like good audio is like so important. That makes, you know, it makes total sense because a lot of the information is like, is what is it? It's spread through like audio, like in how you speak to someone. Like if you keep hearing like, um, like the plosives and like B's and P's, like the P sounds, I hate that when that happens, like, if you've ever been like on TikTok, like recently, um, there's a lot of people just like speaking into their mic, like hard. And I just, I can't watch it at all. Even if whatever they're saying might be like nice or informational, I just skip it because it's just not very pleasing to my like headspace. Yeah. Yeah. So like the voice acting is super important mm -hmm. on animated cartoons because uh yeah, I don't get into like the whole double sub debates. Like, I, I'm just like oh. typically, you know, whatever. But like, if the translation's really weird, then I'll watch the sub. But like, if the voice acting really is like so bad on the dub, then it really does. Like, even if I don't think I'm noticing it, I will like kind of almost hold a grudge against the movie because like I will dislike certain characters just because their voice acting just didn't match what I was seeing on screen or just felt really annoying. I grew up on like like old school kung fu movies, and so like I don't really care because I've had bad dubs. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like okay, I I get content. It's like it's whatever. I I can I can deal with it. But, it kind of adds to the charm. Like yeah. I watched a lot of those too, but like for those like it almost adds to the charm because it's like so integral to the it's, style. It, yeah. It's like the uh, like how we like you know different mediums. It's a type of grain that is in there. It, it's a uh, it's the texture type of thing. It's like it might not have been what we wanted, but like it's there. It gives you back some nostalgia. Mm -hmm. So uh, I can understand it's like the dub and sub debate. It's like the dub people want good dubs because they don't want to think about like reading, but like the subs to like really good dubs well good audio is so much more informational and i think to me it's very psychological because as you're reading uh you're like don't uh reading like the subtitles 
they're not focusing on like what's the what they're saying and you just focus on the visuals mm. so uh, i guess that's really complicated mm-hmm. i get what you mean yeah because before like uh i think it was like a lot of like dubbing cup comp- uh companies like say in anime like crunchyroll funimation um all those other ones before they got their hands on all those and tried to um bring them over to like the united states like officially like fan subs were fine with me at the time it's just and then especially fan dubs were fine because they just a little bit of quirkiness though mm-hmm. yeah so that was like a like a wild west of a time in, on the internet my next one maybe the last one probably was like uh what are you doing now like what What's your current like workflow? What are you currently like pursuing? Okay, so yeah, so like I definitely want to make like uh, animation courses like a different whole other avenue because like the live visual world, of course, is kind of impacted right now still. Um, but like every single year, there's always a new influx of students and people who are interested in learning anything. And like online courses just in general have exploded. It goes like 400% or something. Or maybe it was like even like streaming, just like watching stuff online like Netflix exploded. So just people are on their computers more, at home more. But it's like they're also wanting to learn more, more skills. It's just a matter of finding time to actually sit down and figure out how to crank that out because I like, still have different client work going on. Hmm. So like, yeah, like right now, I don't know if I, how much I, if I can talk about it. Are you on an NDA or something? <laughs> <laughs> I've been learning about that. It's like, I can agree, I can understand. It's like, yeah. you, you can't uh, say anything. It's so. just, let's just say it's like a cartoon. Or not obviously, but oh. it's like, a, it's gonna be like a black and white uh, 1920 style rubber hose battle between two certain kind of popular characters from a certain superhero franchise (laughs) okay i think i can it's 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 gonna just be music no talking but it is more narrative like we were talking about Mm -hmm. uh of course the story is gonna be like weird and surreal but it has a beginning middle end Mm -hmm. so then on top of that um just like doing some more loop stuff, uh, mainly rotoscoping loops of uh, different band members and different like dances and visuals that are just rotoscoping, which, you know, is just tracing over live footage, yeah. which um, is mentally less draining than having to come up with ideas on your own and doing the whole rough animation stage because essentially the rough animation is already done for you. Mm-hmm. You're just translating it into lines but um, yeah, like some tips I learned on rotoscoping is, so I'm doing it at uh, 30 frames a second, that's the video source file, but uh, don't animate every single frame. Yeah. Like if you animate every single frame on rotoscoping, it'll be really jerky and jittery, because yeah. you, your hand can't perfectly get yeah. the shapes. I, I do like, on my animations, I do 24 frames, and then I do uh, one every two frames, like. So I only do like 12 frames per second, really. Well, 24 frames, only do 12 of them if I can. Yeah, yeah. But like That's some frames are longer than the others, but like still. It's often enough, like mm-hmm. there's no one perfect frame rate. It just totally depends on the context of the motion. Mm-hmm. Like if something does go by super fast, I'll put it on once. Because if it's on twos, it'll stutter, it'll strobe. Like if it's moving across the screen mm-hmm. um, or like, yeah. So you just have to understand the context of the motion but like some frames will be on three frames. Some frames will even be on four frames for rotoscoping and it'll still have that snap. The critical thinking for rotoscoping is more about giving some accents to your lines. Like don't just try to perfectly match every squiggle in their clothing. You gotta draw some straights, gotta draw some curves to give it a little bit more life. Yeah. It's about the, like, I guess like the idea of it. It's not, it's not really about like the, the sort of nuances are nice, but it's about the idea of it, making sure your mind understands the concept of the motion. That's how I seen it. You gotta exaggerate. Like, mm-hmm. there's no animation without exaggeration. Mm-hmm. It'll just be lifeless. Mm-hmm. 
So I mean, yeah. animation allows us to like exaggerate too. So I think that's also a big bonus. Yeah. Because <laughs> live action can't stretch your arm like two hundred feet. No. <laughs> so I think that's a great thing. But like, even like rotoscoping, looking at the frames, it's surprising how flexible bodies are. Just the motion blur when people move, like mm -hmm. their jaw will still be like over here as their head's turning fast. So like even just in real life, we're surprisingly squashy and stretchy. So yeah, those are my main gigs right now is uh, trying to figure out how to make courses and then doing some rotoscoping gigs and then working on a particular black and white, like Steamboat Willie style cartoon and having like no time to do any of it. Yeah, I, I know that feeling like schedules and everything and i'm happy you're able to fit me into your schedule for this oh, dude i'm super honored for real like yeah so it's glad like I, yeah. glad you found the card and I'm glad i gave it to you it felt so dumb like i just oh. feel so dorky like no. it's just very uncomfortable to like try to like market yourself yeah. but at the same time like people are interested in in people and what they're doing so like even though it might be uncomfortable Sometimes you just have to, you know, flip the coin. And worst thing that can happen is, you know, so the client or whoever says no, and you're exactly back where you began. So mm. you got to fail your way up to getting things done. Yeah, I've taken that type of concept of having to just, you know, put yourself out there. Um, the, you know, the, the, the idea of like, a, uh, if there's a lack of males in a clownfish like community, one of the uh, females would turn into a male oh, yeah, or yeah. something like that. Um, a lot of people I've like, I'm around because I'm also introverted, right? We're all like the people in the art community. Oh, my art community at my school is very introverted too. And so I've been trying to like force myself to like be more outgoing and like kind of put up a, a facade of a way to be more like outgoing and talk to people, even though like inside my head, I'm screaming. It's like hide in the corner and I'm trying to like instigate people to express themselves, but even though like I'm failing, it's like, you're doing, you're doing great. Like I would have never guessed like you would be nervous at all. Like it, really good. I, I, it's, it's, I, it's like, uh, I don't know if you saw the Pokemon episode where I think the Pokemon's name is Paris. Oh, you were more of a Yu-Gi-Oh guy. Well, I, I watched the show, but like I, I played the I played I played Yu-Gi-Oh and watched Pokemon, which is like well, really weird. Yeah, so Ash has this really weak Pokemon that won't level up. Uh -huh. So what he does is he starts uh, using like Pikachu to weaken the battle, mm -hmm. and then he'll send out Paris and let Paris finish the battle and gains <laughs> experience, and then it learns that it's winning that it can win. Uh -huh. and it's the same with humans; like the more battles and experience points you gain the less scary it becomes over time because your stats are going up. So I really think it's like life is just like an RPG game. Yeah, I, I feel like that way. Working on a team, you'll have like the the people with black magic or white magic, the healers. Yeah, you need to like, spread out the, the group, making sure it's well balanced. Yeah, I understand that totally. Whole it's like yeah. you, need, you need your tanks, you need your healer, you need a magic user if it has magic or like a range user. And that makes total yeah. sense. But my uh, animation partner, Brittany Penn, she's kind of like the healer because she works on all the projects with me. Forgot to mention that. So like having someone to help you, uh, especially with stuff that either you're not like that good at or don't like that much, it really helps the workflow. So she mostly does like the line work. So I'll do the rough animation, send it to her and she'll start doing the cleanup work and then I can get started on the next scene doing the rough animation, and then we'll both color it. Um, so it's it's like really efficient and helpful to have, especially with animation. Like like I said, uh, introverted, don't really want to work on teams. At the same time, like taking that risk of okay, let's see how this goes working with someone, and then it's like, oh, this is actually like a million times better than just trying to figure yeah, out how to do this by myself. Yeah, because sometimes they they can. Um take off some of the weight and then with how they're like spec like you know someone has more defense someone has more attack blah 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 it's like maybe someone has better lead work and maybe you don't have to you're not the best and they can do that you're really good at coloring because you have that eye for color 
and so and you just like mesh well and maybe someone's really good at like compositing uh like and everything or yeah just the different workflows together package it together that type of myth, uh, mentality of like sometimes you don't have to like do a specific job because if you can reach out to someone with the that skill and they want to work in the team as well work in the group sometimes it's the best and uh, i see it like instead of like uh like one plus one it's like or like one plus two it's like two times two you get that multiplication the amplification of skills yeah instead of just like that skill and that skill yeah 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 like 100 percent agree on the flip side it also depends on who the person is because like we all also have our own problems like we don't just bring strengths to the table we also bring psychological insecurities and baggage so like there's this phrase more people more problems so like if the team grows too big it actually becomes counterproductive where it's like your time might be just spent managing people and putting out fires and trying to make sure everyone's working Mm -hmm. so there's definitely like depending on the project there's definitely a limit to where it'll become counterproductive if you start adding too many people to the equation yeah um i think the phrase was uh for as many moving parts that there is there's so many more uh opportunities for failure type of thing like uh more parts makes it more like uh redundant but it also makes it like more viable to failure any kind of art form or just anything you know that you're trying to unless you're just doing it as a hobby as yourself just in your room alone Mm -hmm. you're gonna eventually deal with people like either working with them being hired by them making something for them so like a whole other aspect to learn is just like the social world navigation skills. So like, yeah, just like, well, I just watched like YouTube videos on how to talk to people, <laughs> and like reading books that how to not freak out, how to not be anxious, uh, mindfulness type stuff, which works for me is just like simple breathing exercises, nothing fancy, no, like, you know, big complicated thing. It's just literally, like a deep breath in a deep breath out just focusing on my breath and i get distracted just try to come back to the breath no judgment if i get distracted and uh i do it for like like just a couple minutes like it doesn't have to be an hour or anything that that just works for me personally but there's no one size fits all method for because all of our brain chemistry is different and everyone's life experience is different so but in general like deep breathing is pretty much a safe bet that it's not going to hurt you to slow down your body, your your nervous system, just get it calmed down. Take a moment, get yourself in order, be ready ready yourself for the next next mission, I guess. So that's all my questions. You added a lot more information too. Um, Any last like thoughts, anything? Uh, we're all in this life experiment together. I don't really know what's going on. Just like improvising, but uh, hopefully something I said is valuable. Um, also like deep work, a book I'd recommend just to anyone is a deep work by Cal Newport. And a lot of it will apply to animation work because basically, you know, the summary of it is, is that deep work is cognitively demanding work that you do without distraction and that is highly valuable whereas shallow work is these are tasks that can are very repetitive they tend not to add a ton of new value and they can be easily automated so shallow work is stuff like answering emails answering phone calls working in cash register these types of jobs are very like they're going to be automated by uh, ai you know can just the, like the more deep work you can do that's very unique to you that's really requires a ton of your focus and your personal touch is a lot safer from being automated away by machines so and it's also like when you're just solely focused on the task of say animation and you're not multitasking like checking facebook every 10 minutes 
your work is going to be significantly better because when you multitask, really what you're doing is one t task, like many different tasks one at a time and doing them all not as well because you're shifting your focus across all these different domains and you're more likely to make mistakes. So that would be like number one tip as far as workflow is, is carve yourself a time block to focus on your most important tasks. Say like two or three, four hours tends to be the limit that we can like truly do 100% deep work. And then the rest of the day, do like the more easy work, the more shallow work. Like if it's like animation, like, you know, do your storyboards. We have to really think the beginning of the day. And then the rest of the day, you can do things like coloring or things that not to say those aren't important, but things that are more automatic where you don't have to put as much as your cognitive load into it. Those are some great thoughts and thank you for your time. Absolutely. Thanks yeah. for having me, Josh. Yeah. If I guess if like if I have any questions afterwards in the future, I'll probably send it your way as well. Definitely. Yeah. Feel free to reach out. Yeah, and I'll I'll try to like always keep an eye on what you're doing as well. Like whatever you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. if you make some like send me your showreel or any types of stuff you're working on, I'd like to see it. Yeah. Uh yeah, I'll I'll show like after this, I'll send you what I've done so far, my animation reel. So cool, yeah. cool. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, it was a good talk. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you very much.